and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McMenamin and in this show... Terry from Red23 explains how his company markets residential subdivisions. In this week's panel, Wholesale versus Retail Part 1. But first, Michelle talks to Kylie on how services improved with more women in the industry. Hi, Kylie McGrath. Welcome to the new property show. Um, you work at Ray White Diamond Creek, which is very near and dear to me, um, in Greenwich Shire. Uh, we actually met through a referral, a friend who had such a positive experience using you as a real estate agent. Um, they were singing your praises and I just had to meet you and I actually looked at um, selling my own home and using you as my real estate agent. And I think uh, when selling a property, it's so important to arm yourself with the best person possible. And you, Kylie McGrath, are amazing. I'm just so blown away by how uh, personable you are. You're down to earth. You're so truthful and you say it how it is. You're a sharpshooter. You know what you're talking about. You're very experienced over 15 years in the industry. And we're just really excited to have you on the show today. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. And thank I, you for the beautiful introduction. <laughs> it's, it's no lovely. worries, no worries. Um, we would love um, to hear a little bit about your why. Like, why, why do you work as a real estate agent? And um, being a lady in, I've got a buyer's advocacy business, Co Green Advisory, I actually really want to empower ladies in the real estate space. And I see you to be one of those amazing female real estate agents just killing it out there. And I just wanted to say, um, why is it to encourage more women into this space? Why do you do what you do as a real estate agent? Well, uh, thank you. It, I think it definitely comes down to just wanting to help people. Uh, getting in the industry uh, a long time ago, I saw there was a there was a bit of a missing niche of uh, just a lacking customer service and mm -hmm. and making sure that the vendors, um, as well as the buyers buying into the market, are getting a high level of service, making sure that they. Um, uh, have a happy experience with transacting because mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, probably some negativity around the industry over the years, probably in the 80s and, and even into the 90s. That, yeah. um, and I think more more female, more women in real estate coming in to that space is, yeah. is levelling it out a little bit Great. and definitely increasing that high level of customer service that I think everyone should enjoy when selling a home. Um, and from a buying perspective, I'm always happy and, and work with, with people like yourself, um, giving them some some tips and ideas of how to how to scope the buying buying world and how to navigate with with real estate agents and and yeah, to dissect their lingo. That's and awesome because I've actually had some of your tips and tricks along the way as well. You provide a very comprehensive document to people who want to know what are the best questions to ask a real estate agent. Like it's a daunting process buying a property. You're buying the major thing. It might be the most expensive purchase you'll ever make. So yes. um, having the trust of a real estate agent is really important. And I know you give. Um, uh, I know that uh, being a lady, there's actually a massive increase in single women and divorced ladies and ladies in the um, space wanting to actually step out and jump out and, build, um, and buy property. And I think that's awesome because yeah. I give people tips that don't wait for your Prince Charming to come along, be your Prince Charming. You're the person that's going to drive this. So if you've got money in the bank sitting there, you should buy a property. And that's what I encourage people to do. Uh, be that independent person, buy your first property, leverage it, and then continue on your journey to financial freedom. And that's what we try and do. We try and um, help people as well. But in saying that, the real estate agent, you also have to be able to um, yeah, trust the real estate agent that you're working with. And when, yes. when um, selling a property, uh, you also have a lot of emotion involved. And I think that's what you handle really well, Kylie, when I've worked alongside you. Thank you, That yes. you really take in, in control of every situation is different. Everyone's unique. Everyone's Absolutely. got a story to tell. But at the end of the day, you are fantastic at coming alongside people and helping people. And I really think that's where your heart lies. And, and yes. that's what you do really well. You want the best outcome for your client. Like me as a buyer's advocate, I want the best <laughs> outcome for my client. So that's why at the end of the day, we've got a common goal. We want to sell, sell the property, yes. buy the property. So we're, yeah, it's buying a property, selling a property. And I think that's what's awesome. And I like that we're friends and 
that we can um, and do that. Um, and I've got another really burning question mm -hmm. that I think a lot of the viewers might like uh, to hear the answer to, and that is um, if someone wants to uh, sell a property, what are your top tips for selling a property? Um, I've had people say, oh, should I do a renovation or should I? What would you recommend people to do um, if they wanted to sell a property tomorrow? What would they yes. need to do? 100%. It's, it is really about putting your buyer goggles on and starting getting mm -hmm. an idea of what your property makes people feel when they enter in. So mm -hmm. what buyers are looking for is they're looking for objections and, and you want to try and eliminate as many objections as you can. They mm -hmm. could be peeling paint, you know, un, unfresh service, surfaces that need mm -hmm. a bit of fresh paint, uh, tidy up garden areas, mm -hmm. uh, putting some, some fresh mulch and just giving that appearance. Often replacing carpets and a fresh paint job is enough. Mm -hmm. um, if the bathrooms and kitchens aren't deteriorating and falling apart, there's no need to do a full renovation. Mm -hmm. It's really about presenting the property um, as is to its best um, fresh appeal to the to the buyers. They don't spend a lot of time in the open homes. It's really only sort of a 10, 15 minute inspection quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes a sec followed by a second inspection, but they are uh, prepared to, to commit and it's generally based on that emotional feeling mm -hmm. they have whilst they're in the property. When they come in. So sometimes yeah, some furniture maybe, staging. Yeah, staging styling. I've heard that to yes. be good as well. Or yes. Even though I had a tip of a really nice smell, warm brownies or a Absolutely. candle, vanilla scented candle or almond or something might yes. get a buyer. Anything, anything to set <laughs> to off that, that emotional appeal. Have the whole experience as well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's all part of it. Spring is actually uh, a massive time for real estate agents. There's a lot of houses going into the market. There's a bit of uncertainty going on in the world we're living with, high interest rates and you know different things going on around the world. Um, how do you see leading up to Christmas? I mean, we're bang in the middle of spring. Have you seen the market to be the same or any different? Have you got a lot of stock on at the moment? Or? Definitely, yeah. Definitely has seen an oversupply of property. It's, it's mm -hmm. tipping into that direction. But all that is doing is making it more of a balanced market. So mm -hmm. buyers are coming into the market and transacting and purchasing a property for what they would consider perhaps a fair and reasonable price. Okay. Vendors much the same are selling the property for a fair and reasonable price. It's not a, a vendor favoured or a buyer favoured market as it stands mm -hmm. for, the, the for the tail end of this year. Yeah. Um, quite balanced, which is, you know, it takes a bit more work on my end to negotiate mm -hmm. something that is fair on both sides or, you know, trying yeah. to obviously get the best outcome for my vendors. Uh, but it really is coming into that and that's based on the fact that there has been the interest rate hikes over mm -hmm. the, the fact that it was a sort of overinflated market during COVID and that mm -hmm. was due to the undersupply. So being now an oversupply, it's balancing out a, a fair bit. And I think in the next 12 months, we'll start to see Back to a, a regular, us, 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 usual market. <laughs> yes, a usual market usual that's going market. on. Because yeah. Leading up to Christmas, when would you advise people to put their property on the market? Do you think there's a, a right time? Is it timing the market or when's a good time to put your property if you're going to list it? I often get that question, when's a good time? And I, I'd like to ask, throw it over to it you is, to ask. It is. It's a really good question. And my, my general go-to answer is really, it's when you're ready. When you're ready. I love and that And that, that can be you might yes. need to be emotional emotionally ready, financially mm -hmm. ready, physically ready with the property, physically working out where you're going to go next, mm -hmm. mentally ready. Um, but if you were to pick a time, you want to try and pick a time where it's not going to have the oversupply. So away yeah. from spring. A lot of people mm -hmm. focus on spring because the gardens are looking amazing, mm. people are out and about. But often we get our, our better results in the tail end of, of winter, okay. July, August. Very interesting. Yeah, trying yeah. to beat that spring rush. Um, yeah, less properties on the market. Yeah, more opportunity. Generally still a lot of buyers, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I didn't think, it, think of it like that, but thanks for sharing it. Terry, welcome to the new property show. Thank you for coming on as a guest. Thanks, Steve. Absolute pleasure to be here today. So, Red23, uh, founded a few years ago now. Yep. Do you want to tell us the story of... Uh, uh, obviously Red23 and yep. what you guys do? Sure, so Red23 I founded uh, back in uh, 2007, so mm -hmm. 16 years ago. Uh, we are a uh, project marketing business. So in essence what we do is we market residential land subdivisions on behalf of developers that uh, don't have their own sales team. So they employ our sales team and our uh, expertise in selling uh, residential land. Um, we do that through our vast network of builders and through House of Land Packages and our passion for putting people into homes, basically. Are you still doing the land sales offices out there or not? Yep. Yeah. So we, uh, generally we market from a land sales office. Uh, sometimes at projects that are 
uh, probably a little bit smaller. Uh, our projects range from anywhere from 22 you know, lots to 2,500 lots, which is our biggest one on behalf of uh, Development Victoria at the moment out mm -hmm. at Werribee. Um, but anything that's sort of maybe 200 or more will have a dedicated land sales office and a dedicated land sales representative with an associate or sometimes two salespeople, depending on... There's uh, a, lot of fun to, uh, a lot of fun to visit. I've, I come from that um, Metricon Simmons high volume yep. sales office and relationships yep. are key there. Yep. Um, so I guess for the customer's point of view, what are they seeing that's different with a Red 23 versus some of your competitors? Yep. If they walk in, what's the experience difference? Well, I think at the end of the day, the way we work with our sales people to train them in, in their selling um, day to day is to really take an interest in qualifying the buyer. Mm -hmm. So it's working with a buyer to solve mm -hmm. a problem. Uh, it's not necessarily just about selling a block of land to a buyer. Uh, it's about addressing their needs. Um, it all starts with a, a problem that the buyer has, whether it be uh, it's a change of uh, lifestyle or it might be that the family's growing or whatever it might be. Um, we're there to, to help them navigate that. Uh, building a house um, is not an easy thing, so it's about matching them with the right builder. Uh, so we go to great lengths to understand what those needs are and then we try to direct them to a builder that's going to uh, help them and assist them in getting the house um, and with the require. with the land, um, I guess from an outsider's point of view, you just think it's a paddock and some and some construction. Yep. Um, yep. But there's a few fundamental key points to it. Yep. Uh, and I'd like to explore that a little bit further. But if you could help us uh, in terms of the, I guess our, our buyers out there. Sure. Um, so land size. Yep. There's a thing called fall. Yep. Um, there's also a thing called um, compact, compaction. Compaction. Yeah. Uh, but what are some of the pitfalls there? And then also developers' requirements. So yep. you just want to run us through. If you're a customer, what are some of those key questions you really need to know about? So I think the first thing really is to do is to identify a budget that mm -hmm. the uh, customer needs to work to. From there, then you you will uh, drill it down to a land size mm -hmm. uh, with a, a house that's going to fit the budget. So you're really working with a total overall package uh, that's going to suit that budget. When you're talking about fall of land, uh, fall over land, anything that's over 300 millimetres of fall is going to attract uh, an extra cost. And that's generally because you're talking about more concrete uh, mm -hmm. or there's going to be more excavation work that's going to take to level the block out in order for the builder to be able to build the house. So fall is really, really important important and identifying a block with fall um, and the impact that it will have on your building costs is something that a lot of buyers don't really understand. So it's our job to explain to them that, you know, this is some of the pitfalls that they have to look out for if they do choose to go and look for a builder on their own. The beauty of a house of land package is that that is all taken into consideration and most of the time it's allowed for in the actual package price. So there's no hidden surprises there. Um, when you're talking about orientation and new building mm. codes that are coming next year, um, the size of the lot is going to impact the orientation of the house and you, the uh, energy ratings that you're going to have to achieve. So a lot of that stuff is what we actually um, work through with the client to make sure that they have a, a full understanding of it. Then you talk about fill. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, when developers are developing residential land subdivisions, there may have been a... Uh, uh, a water course uh, or there might have been a dam that's been filled in. Mm. Um, anything that's been filled in with soil and albeit they'll, they'll compact it and try to get it to what they consider uh, what would be natural, mm -hmm. um, you do have to go, go further down with your foundations, uh, which again is extra costs because there's a lot more uh, concrete that's being poured. So that all adds to the price. So if you're dealing with a a company that may not necessarily understand the building process properly, uh, it does translate into extra costs for the customers. And at the moment, affordability is key, right? Things are becoming more and more expensive. So uh, all those hidden things that you're not aware about, uh, aware of will add to cost. I think it's changed too over the years. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, the, the standard thing, apart from sorting out your finance, yep. which you didn't even really need to do, you could almost no. you could almost go in blindfolded yes. and buy in any order. Yep. <laughs> um, you might have started with the de dream design in mind and the yep. right builder, uh, but I think probably the most fundamentally the most important things nowadays would really be starting with the right block of land because you've got to start without the location. There's no use having yeah. the dream builder. Yep. Uh, so I think that's also key. Um, but then I think some of the other challenges might be identifying a builder that's had experience with that particular land estate yep. uh, because they understand some of the pitfalls. Now, there's other ways to overcome site, um, site fall, like, such as stepping, um, stepping houses, yep. Uh, rebating uh, and making garages a bit deeper. Uh, we used to do that. 
and you can actually work with the design of the land. Sometimes with some of the clients that I used to deal with, I'd actually look for blocks with fall um, so that we can create um, great entertaining areas with, yep. um, I guess, balconies and that sort of stuff as well. Um, now, when identifying, I guess, pricing at the moment, um, how's that changed in the last couple of years? Because um, I guess in the West, used to be easily under a thousand bucks a square metre. Uh, how do you find the pricing of land is going now? Price, uh, land prices have escalated um, quite dramatically, mm -hmm. uh, especially through COVID. Um, we've seen you know exponential uh, price increases, and that's just been driven by pure supply demand. At the moment, uh, there is no. Um, secret that we're suffering a major housing shortage um, and that's only adding to house prices increasing. So, you know, where you might have been buying a block of land a couple of years ago, um, and we'll just pick a, an arbitrary number of 250,000, you know, that block mm -hmm. now is worth probably 350 and probably closer to 400,000. So uh, land prices have gone up quite a bit which obviously then affects affordability, which means that people don't have as much money to spend on the house. So you're right in you have to identify the right block of land for the house, but I think even more important now is that you have to get your finances in order and understand what you can spend in order to then go and find the right house and the right block that's going to suit your needs. Some of the other challenges that have happened is if you've bought off the plane, essentially off the plane land, a year, uh, year into the future. At that time, yep. your affordability wouldn't have been okay. Correct. But with 13 rate rises, even yep. if you bought that land at 250,000, yep. and the bank still says, hey, it's a great block of land you've bought, your serviceability goes. That's exactly um, right. There is some challenges there. So thoughts on that. So should you be just buying, trying to be finding a title block of land, title within three months, get to site, get it built? Or um, if you're an experienced, I guess, mum and dad investor, uh, is there money still to be made in buying off, but something is two years away, but then we can run into sunset clauses? Yeah. Um, theories on those? So I guess it's a bit of a, uh, yeah, it really depends on the, on the customer's need mm -hmm. and um, where they are financially. Uh, I would always suggest that if you could buy a block of land that is titled and ready to go, um, you can take advantage of the, the current price in the market. Um, and you can go out there and you can build. I, I look at real estate a little bit differently. If you are looking at a long-term hold and it's not just a, a buy and a flip, mm -hmm. um, I've started, I started my journey back in, you know, 92 selling house and land. So uh, we were in the depth of the recession where people uh, couldn't imagine that prices would extend to where they are today. And when I look back historically, every 10 years, house prices do actually double in the regions. Seven was what it was in the inner metropolitan areas. If you're looking at the, at the greenfield areas and when we're talking about, you know, where all the new building and developing is happening, building prices do actually double every 10 years. So whether you're buying, you know, now or in two years' time, if your plan is that you're going to be there for a, a, a good amount of time, the house prices will double. So it really depends on your circumstances. Uh, if you need a house to live in, then title block of land, you'll take advantage. Builders at the moment have got some incentives for people that have got title blocks. Um, the risk you run with having a block of land that might be titled in two years is that prices could potentially escalate even further. Um, you never know. They might come back a little bit, which I find that very hard to believe. I don't think that they'll come back. Um, but what the extended time frame gives people is a time to save up deposits and really save and explore which house is going to be the house so buy now, pay later. Yeah, yep. pretty much. So the other thing you get is that um, should the market increase, which, yep, it's pretty flat at the moment, um, but we're thinking that in another two years the market will be going going hard again um, and off the uh, a current um, some current statistics that we've been um, uh, shown. Um, if that all comes true, uh, market will kick in, as it always does. I think, as you said before, there is a short supply. There's there is. massive immigration happening, yeah, 100,000 migrants. Yep. Um, not enough people with certainty to build. There's landlords no. selling up. Um, so there's actually an undersupply, really, <laughs> of new homes for, yep. for rental. Um, something does uh, draw to my attention. And your company could have, back in 92, gone two different directions. You obviously yep. come from a similar industry to myself, yes. selling the house and land. You could have gone two ways. You could have been a building company. Yep. Um, but you know, I guess you were probably cornered into one product only. That's right. Is that why you made the switch to land? Or why did Red 23 get created? I think for Red 23, uh, we identified a gap in the market, and that was to work closely with developers to help them achieve their vision for their project. Um, 
traditionally, I think, uh, you know, it's just really been an approach of let's just sell as many blocks as we can. Um, whereas now it's about, for us, where we get excited is working with a, closely with a developer, working out what they want to achieve in the project. And we're pretty selective with the developers that we work with at the moment. Um, and we want to work with good quality developers that have got, that want to leave a legacy. We don't really want to be working with a cut and carve that just don't really care what the long term you know, plan is for the project. They want to drive through a project and be proud that they developed it. And that's what gives us the pleasure, is going through a completed project, seeing, you know, families living in their homes, kids playing in the parks, and the parks have actually been delivered as they were being promised. I think what I'd like to cover in, uh, I guess, next year's episode would be, yep. uh, we'd love to hear the story of the farmer. Yes. Um, the wine, the drinks, the, the yep. deals that are done over the tables, because that's yep. still done. Yep, sure uh, Because you, you're really dealing with the farmer that's got yes. the land. Yep. Uh, and then the developer comes in and you've got to get the two together. We'd love to hear that story, but Terry, you've been an amazing guest. Thank and you. we'll see you again on the new property It's show. been a pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, welcome to the new property show. Uh, this one could get heated. Um, okay, so... <laughs> It's always a good start. So um, wholesale versus retail. Um, and what we're talking about here is builds, okay? Um, what the difference is between a retail uh, and a wholesale build. Uh, and obviously there's owner occupiers and investors. But who wants to open it up and sort of tell us their interpretation of the difference between a retail build and a wholesale build? And I think, Lucky, you're yeah. off. Thanks, Steve, uh, to give me a chance to start this conversation. Uh, what I think, like for the retail, and there are lots of design and lots of custom things and different color scheme, whatever you want, you can design that. But in a um, wholesaler, it's like, as I said, it's a, like a sausage roll. All the sausage are the same. Same, uh, there are not much option. No, there's no, you can't differentiate. It's, it looks like all the same houses. So, but it's good for the, like, investment purpose. But if someone wants to live in the house, they want some, they want their own uh, theme in the house, like a color scheme, stone scheme, and bedrooms, and location, uh, windows. So lots of things are matter. So, but in retail, you can do that. But in wholesale, there's a very less options. That's what I think. And uh, Bo, over to you. So you're in the wholesale space. Yeah, I'd um, probably say yeah. just just depends on what you want to get out of it. So for me, I only work with investors. And uh, I think, you know, with investors, it's more about... Uh, we, if you are going to spend money, you know, are you actually going to get a rental return for that? Are you actually going to get a uh, a better valuation for that? So I think that you know, when you're adding optional extras, you don't want to be spending extra money, especially as an investor that should be guided by the numbers and the data and the statistics. You should only be spending money on what you're going to essentially get a return from. So in that situation, I would say that uh, for an investor, an all-inclusive package that includes the driveways, floors, landscaping, uh, you know, developer guidelines, uh, a fixed price cost with, without any variation, even if rocks hit. You know, I think that all of these sorts of things are going to be really good for an investor that just wants to know exactly what they're going to get and they can see what the outcome is going to be rather than, you know, doing optional upgrades as an investor when they might not be getting the money back. So I think um, maybe for an owner-occupier, you know, absolutely might be might be a good thing to have a custom or a retail. Um, for me, I, I like investors to, to essentially just focus on the numbers and, and go I think for it a, can get a bit wholesale. dangerous. I've seen um, when I was selling retail, yep. um, people that would spend $200,000 on a house, then they spend $200,000 in the extras. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, over when they <laughs> Overcapitalising. Yeah. But they could have bought a three hundred thousand dollar house, little bit, a uh, few extras, uh, and had a substantially bigger house. Like having a mini with, uh, when I, with a V eight, and it's just not going to go. You're just not going to get the whole family in there. Mm. Um, now you're out on site a little bit. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on? Um, I said over customising places versus just keeping it simple. Uh, well, from my point of view, when we deal mostly with own occupiers, so mm -hmm. not too many investors. Um, but for the own occupiers, like my point of view is it's your home. You've got to live in it. Like, and I say to people all the time, like, if you want to paint it pink, paint it pink. Like it's your mm -hmm. house. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to live it. Um, yeah, I've had clients that have, you could argue they have overcapitalized on it, but they're going to live in it and they're going to enjoy it. So I think mm -hmm. it also comes, like from my point of view, it comes down to, you know, how much do you want to enjoy that house? 
you know, if you're going to be there for 20 years, you're better off spending the money to get it the way you want it rather than, you know, getting a cookie cutter thing, saving a few bucks. Like, I think it really depends. I don't deal with the investor side of things. Like, I've seen a few of them, but, you know, I don't deal with that. I deal with the owner occupier, and I think, you know, if you're going to live in it, you've got to really enjoy it. What about you, Manesh? I guess, yeah, again, as Bo mentioned, it depends on the purpose. People are trying to buy something as well. But as a, as a customer or also as a consultant, I, I think peace of mind is also a very important thing with the wholesale channels or you know that is, and the banks also like a fixed price contract. They, as a customer, also I know this is the price I'm going to pay. I'm not going to have to chase the tradesman for two, three months to get my fencing done, my landscaping done and things like that. So all those things uh, also we have to keep in mind before we making a selection. So if, I'm, if, I'm, if I want to limit my budget to and I need to know upfront what is going to be my actual cost and I include those extra 30 to 40,000 into my building contract rather than having to use my savings later on when the house is finished. So that's sort of something tips um, uh, in the favor of a wholesale channel builder or things like that. Plus, again, of course, you have to, like Bo also mentioned, like we have to stick to what we want. If we are an investor, we want capital growth, we want rent return, and we want the tax depreciation. That's that's the whole purpose I think of the house. Custom yeah. can work, but you've got to look at, um, you really got to look at what those hidden costs are. Um, mm -hmm. So the challenge that I have with custom is that, and depending on the consultant that you deal with, and that's why I say why you help out. But there's things that are excluded. Uh, so typically I've heard of houses without driveways, <coughs> landscaping, fences, blinds, curtains, that sort of stuff, air conditioning. Now some of those items can be $30,000. Um, and your, your customer's left with that with an unfinished house and there's nothing worse than driving past a brand new home that has newspaper. <laughs> um, and I've seen it on the windows. Yep. So it can be fraught with a little bit of danger. Um, yeah. No, I don't think so, because uh, in the retail as well, uh, like as, I, as you know, uh, what's my job is, so I give my clients a fixed price contract, mm -hmm. and if they want turnkey as well, so I look after in them in that way as well. So I give them a turnkey price, mm -hmm. fixed price, with all the upgrades and what they want, and I design that way, so they can get a custom home with a fixed price contract and turnkey finish. Not a bad bit of rebuttal there. <laughs> um, that's actually not too bad, lucky, which is good. That's all for this week, and thank you for watching. If you'd like to see our full episodes, please check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv, and we'll see you guys again next week.